So, uh, very good. Uh, I mean, you can start and uh, thanks a lot for uh, organizing this. Okay, see you later. So, start. we don't have to take care about the recording for the whole three hours? We'll be, uh, yeah, I think oh. she will manage. Okay, so. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, some some more people is joining. Uh, maybe we can use this uh, initial time uh, to introduce uh, the speakers. So first of all, uh, I'm Marco Melia, Professor Marco Melia from Politecnico Torino. I'm one of the chair uh, that uh, uh, was organizing the, the tutorials this year in, in performance. Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, this uh, uh, tutorial is about privacy preserving uh, uh, data processing and the two speakers uh, are uh, Martino Trevisan and Luca Vassio. Both are also from Politecnico Torino actually working uh, uh, with me. And this talk, uh, uh, it will introduce you to the concept of uh, uh, privacy preserving analytics and with some uh, uh, part that is also related to a European project called PIM City that uh, uh, is working on, on this in this area. So I welcome uh, uh, Martino uh, that will be giving the first part of the, the of the course. Then Luca will take uh, uh, the second part. There is also an hands-on session at the end where you can run some experiments. You will be invited to run uh, some uh, uh, some algorithms and test the test the results. The whole uh, the duration of the um, presentation and the session is three hours, more or less. I guess you can always uh, uh, interrupt uh, Martin and Luca using the chat or the Q&A session. There is also a Slack channel, and Martino will give you more, more details about this, where uh, uh, it's possible to, to list uh, uh, and see the previous uh, uh, messages, while here on the chat is more uh, temporary. We get a certificate for participation uh, at the end uh, of the uh, tutorial in the 10 days. For this, you need to register on a website. Again, details will come uh, after with uh, Martino and Luca. So Martino, the floor is yours. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for the introduction and welcome. I will try to share my screen. Okay make presenter perfect okay okay now you should see my screen yes so yes. perfect okay so good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to this tutorial about privacy preserving data processing uh the two lecturer, it's me, Martino Trevisan, and uh, Professor Luca Vassio. We are both from Politecnico di Torino. Uh, so first, let me say a few words uh, about me. So I am assistant professor in Politecnico di Torino, and my research field is mostly in understanding the internet and the web uh, through big data and machine learning techniques, because the web is very complicated, and so you need to put some order in it using big data and machine learning. During my research, uh, I often had to face uh, personal data and personal information, and that's why I started to be interested in uh, privacy preserving analytics and uh, the processing. The other lecturer is uh, Professor uh, Luca Vassio. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself uh, briefly. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody. So I'm also a STEM professor and I have a similar background, but uh, my research is more focused in the human behavior and human interaction with technologies that could be uh, internet measurements, but also uh, smart mobility and these fields are closely related with uh, privacy because uh, nowadays uh, uh, they, they these research are based on uh, data that are private okay thank you luca so the goal uh, of the today tutorial is uh, to understand why we can say we are in a big data era and why these data that are privacy related information are an issue in general and why privacy preserving analytics are a challenging task then 
uh, we want that you understand uh, uh, why it's not easy to anonymize data, and we will give you an overview of the most popular techniques for that anonymization. And finally, you will put your hands on a real use case. You will use the libraries that we will explain you to anonymize uh, a real data set so that you can see in practice how does it mean to anonymize data. So our outline for today is first, uh, I want to convince you that we are in the data-driven economy era. So data are ubiquitous and are also useful for the societies, but there are problems when handling this kind of data because very often, mostly they are personal information and uh, they are sensitive. And so we need anonymization to treat them. And this is difficult. You need techniques like uh, k-anonymity and differential privacy that we will explore. These are the most popular two techniques for uh, privacy preserving data processing. I will explain you which are the open source tools for anonymizations. So tools, programs, and libraries. And finally, you will put your hands on uh, a data set using Python and using Jupyter, completely uh, using our Jupyter Hub uh, uh, website. So you just need your browser. So I also want to recall you this uh, Meet the Star event. This is a very nice event by performance. And this is for PhD students and miracle career postdoc. In this event, which is online November 12, at 11 a.m. New York time, so in the afternoon here in, in Europe. Uh, there you can meet uh, senior professors and researchers. Uh, there are very nice participants, very expert participants. Uh, and there you can talk about your research and get also useful feedback. So please participate. So let's start from understanding why uh, there are a lot of data now in the internet in IT systems. So the amount of data worldwide increased a lot. Some years ago, we were talking about terabytes. Now there are petabytes, exabytes, and we are living in the era of zettabytes. And between these measures, there are three orders of magnitude. So the data are exploding. One simple way to measure how many data there are worldwide is to see how many hard disks are sold and shipped worldwide. And here there is this graph that tells you that uh, this is a, this is a real data up to 2018. Then it is a forecast that the, the, the disks sold worldwide are exploding. We are at uh, various zettabytes per year of data. And also these data are created by people. Now we are also in the era of social networks. People are creating more and more tweets. This is up to 2012. Now Instagram has become more popular and people make uh, uh, more and more posts, images, pictures, and videos on Instagram. So things are exploding. And that's uh, why people talk about big data. You probably have heard about big data. Uh, what are big data? Big data is a hat under which there are a lot of uh, techniques, uh, possibilities, issues. Uh, there are uh, things like uh, data science, like analytics under the head of big data. There is no unique definition of big data, but the most accepted one is that big data are those data with scale, diversity, complexity, require new architecture and techniques to extract some knowledge out of them. So if you're facing data that are too big and too complex to be processed with your PC, you are facing a problem of big data. Where this data came from, the data uh, in the internet, this data come from uh, very diverse uh, sources. This is, there is this nice uh, website called Internet Lab Stats, where you see in real time how many data are on the, on the web. There are billions of internet users uh, that make billions of searches, write millions of Twitter posts, there are videos on YouTube created every day, millions of videos on, on YouTube. And I mean, all this data on the internet is data created by people. So there are personal information there. This personal information on the internet, 
on the other hand, they are useful because can be used to make a lot of things that are good for society, for the societal benefit and for economy. So for example, Google used to predict the flu outbreak two weeks before the outbreak using just the queries, the search queries on Google. If you see prediction and reality, the two lines, they mostly overlap. And so this is an example why data are so useful. Uh, this prediction is correct. If you see it's not correct in 2013 when uh, Google <laughs> made a, a big mistake, but in general data are useful for a lot of things. Uh, McKinsey, which is one of the worldwide biggest consulting company says that uh, we are in the era of data driven economy and the economy can benefit 2.5 trillion uh, dollars by 2025 and only banking can benefit 260 billion per year from data-driven approaches. Data are useful in a wide range of sectors. Location-based data is, is useful for mobility prediction, for insurance, uh, purchase uh, and uh, e-commerce data is useful to increase the net margin of retail uh, platforms. Data are useful also for manufacturing. There is the uh, wide uh, sector of predicting manufacturing, which is about data. And also data are useful for the public sector, for the healthcare in Europe and, and US as well. Data are very useful. Data are generated by a very uh, diverse set of sources. I mentioned data generated by people, but there are also data generated by instruments, uh, by health and scientific computing. If you remember this very nice picture of a black hole was generated by uh, uh, processing various terabytes and petabytes of data from telescopes and they made to create this nice picture. Where do actually uh, data live? They live on web servers. They come from servers, they come from uh, uh, computers, IT system, but also from networks of sensors. So sometimes you have also data that are scattered around a large uh, number of uh, microcomputers. Data are useful only if you uh, consider them together. Imagine this very nice real-time uh, traffic map. You create it uh, by combining data from cars, data from sensors. You have a nice map, you do some computing and you get a real, this real-time traffic information. This is hard and also involves data from a lot of people and you have to take care when you handle data of billions of people. Uh, who owns this data? This data are typically owned by companies, companies that during their business collect data. So online shops like Amazon, eBay, search engines, uh, Google, Bing, uh, insurance companies, navigation systems, uh, uh, telco operators that have the traffic data. And also website and advertisement platforms have personal data. And I want to start uh, from this advertising platform because this has been the first sector where we uh, have seen a tension between user privacy and economy. So uh, all the field of uh, advertisement and behavioral advertisement generated some tension about privacy of users. And these tensions was created by the phenomenon, the so-called web tracking. Maybe some of you know what is web tracking. Web trackers are services that collect the browsing history of people while they browse the web. They are third party services that collect these uh, browsing history. They create profiles about users and then they use these profiles for behavioral advertisement. So for uh, targeted ads. So let's see briefly how this works. So uh, web tracking is uh, actually very simple, the operation. When you go on, uh, for example, with your PC on BBC, your PC contacts uh, uh, the BBC web server to download the main HTML, the web page. Then images are potentially hosted on other servers like uh, cloud providers, Amazon, uh, uh, some in infrastructure. And then in the page, if the page em embeds the tracker trackme.com, your browser also contacts trackme.com. Trackme.com sets a cookie on your browser. And then trackme.com knows that you've been on BBC. And then when you go on Washington Post, 
if it embeds the same tracker, trackme.com will know that you have been on both websites, BBC and Washington Post, thanks to the cookie that it set. So imagine that you repeat this and this over all the websites that a user visits, and for millions of users, then you can create some profiles of users and use them for behavior advertising. Trackers are very widespread, so the most popular are from Google, from the Google Galaxy, and they reach almost 100% of internet users. These data are from 2016, but the, the situation is very similar now. They are very widespread and they can do a lot of things. They do typically behavioral advertising, which is uh, targeted ads based on what you, they think you may need. So this is annoying because you get very invasive ads about, for example, uh, broadband access. These are very wide, invasive, and maybe you don't like them. But also there are problems uh, in this kind of ecosystem because all this data can be used also for bad purposes. So for example, there has been a case uh, when the target uh, when the, the target company figured out that the girl was pregnant before her father and was sending some ads to their house. And this was possible uh, because of the gathering of this browsing history of this girl. Also, data brokers have been found to sell, to exchange health-related data of people. Also, if they were uh, uh, victims of rape, uh, AIDS patient, uh, and so all the disease of people who were sold on the market. And also, this is sometimes not very good for democracy because uh, uh, security agency can use this to track people. So to put some order on this, the legislators started to create some law on privacy. The first law is uh, uh, from Europe, is the so-called cookie law. And maybe all of you know, uh, this law asks websites to ask the consent before storing cookies on, uh, on, the, on our devices. And this is done typically with this uh, banner, the cookie banner here. And this is the first result of this tension between users uh, privacy and companies. The second law that I want to mention is the so-called GDPR. The GDPR uh, is the General Data Protection Regulation entered into force in 2018 that protects data from uh, European citizens worldwide. And according to G the GDPR, all personal data are any information related to a person. So it can be identifiers like your name, your surname, or some characteristics of people like genetic, mental, or cultural information. I want to mention the GDPR because uh, also as a researcher, if you need to collect some personal data, you must know the principles of the GDPR and you must respect them also if you're researchers. So according to GDPR, data processing must respect accountability. So be responsible to what you do and also document what you do with personal data. Privacy must be by design. When you design a system related to privacy, you must assess its impact before deploying it. Privacy must be by default, so you cannot accumulate data without a purpose. And when, when you do collect data, you must declare which is the purpose of your, of your collection. And this purpose must be stated clearly and correctly. You must be transparent. You must uh, ask for the consent by users, uh, and this consent uh, must be freely given. And users must be uh, allowed to download all their data from your platform, like, for example, you can do with Facebook or Google. And you must collaborate uh, with authorities in case of data breaches. There are uh, some roles that the GDPR uh, defines while treating personal information. Users, final users, are the data subjects. If you're a company that collects personal information, you are a data controller because you control some personal information. And if you, are, uh, if you resort to a third party company for processing it, like for example, you use uh, Amazon Web Services or some cloud provider to host the data, there is the idea of data processor that processes the data on behalf of a controller. And also companies must have a DPO, a data protection officer, who is uh, an employee of the, of the company and must surveil the respect of the GDPR uh, and collaborate with the management of the company to the respect of the GDPR and must also surveil and contact authorities in case of data breaches. 
And this is important that you know this because also as researchers, you may need to uh, face this kind of personal uh, information related issues. Also, you may need to write the assessments from the GDPR, the privacy impact assessment and the data protection impact assessment. These are documents that you must write also as a researcher if you collect personal information. The privacy impact assessment is a document that must describe uh, at design time how your system handles personal information and the data protection impact assessment is a document that uh, defines and states the risk of the uh, of issues related to privacy during the operation of your system and there are processes to do this i don't want to go in deep but you must know that this app exists anonymization is not that easy because uh, publishing personal information is not easy uh, in the last years uh, researchers and company tried to publish personal information anonymizing the data but uh, they realize it's not as easy as it seems because the first thing that you would do when you have to anonymize data is for example to remove the user identifiers so for example if you have a bulk of data browsing history or uh, network data or proxy data you remove the user identifier or if you have some health data you remove the name the address of the people in your data set and you think that these data are anonymous but actually it's not that simple and I want to show you some cases in which bad data anonymization created some problems. The first uh, case is the case of the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission. Uh, they decided to release the data about hospital visits of the public employee of Massachusetts. And the goal was to help researcher. Uh, the, the goal was very good. It was to help researcher in understand the public health. They, uh, publish this data, they remove name, address, and social security number, but th this was not enough because a researcher, Latanya Zwini, managed to de-anonymize this data, and this was actually quite simple. So this is the data set about medical, uh, about medical information that included zip, birth date, and sex of people. She enriched this data buying the voter list of Massachusetts, and then she joined, like in SQL, she joined the two datasets. And in many cases, she managed to de-anonymize some records. For example, uh, uh, she managed to de-anonymize the record of the governor because uh, only six people were living in Cambridge and shared his birth date. Only three of them were men and only one was living in zip code. And so uh, she managed to get the record on all the hospital visits uh, of the governor, even if the Massachusetts uh, group was thinking that data were anonymous, actually, they were not so anonymous. There is a body of literature out of this case, and this literature says that actually, uh, if you have gender zip code and date of birth of a person, it's very likely that you can uniquely identify this person. And so you have to take care when you handle this kind of data. Uh, another popular case is about America Online, which was a very popular search engine. Maybe you don't remember, I do. Uh, America Online released uh, an anonymized dataset about uh, search queries on uh, its search engine. So the search queries people were searching. They anonymized the user ID just by replacing the user ID with a number but this number was consistent across all the data set and this was very useful for researchers for understanding for example the human behavior of people of what they search on the search engine but also there was some very bad effect for example uh, here is the same a sample of, uh, of the data set user search query date and also here you see that people sometimes search something that you don't want to be disclosed like how does a male cocaine use affect a fetus? But also uh, people managed to de-anonymize some users in the data set. For example, they de-anonymized Thelma Arnold by looking at uh, her search queries. They realized that this, uh, this ID was this lady Thelma Arnold and she involuntarily became a public person and all uh, her habits were disclosed uh, in, uh, in the web, for example, that she was looking for a 60 single man 
or uh, that she had a dog that urinated on everything. And this was clearly not wanted by who released the data set. The third, uh, the third uh, thing that I want to mention is the denomination of the Netflix prize. Netflix released a data set of 100 million ratings of movies from their, 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 their platform, about 500,000 users, so 10% of, of the total users of Netflix. And the goal was a competition, a data challenge to improve the recommendation system. So they have a system that recommend a movie uh, to a person if uh, the recommendation system thinks that this person may like it. And then they mm, publish this data to allow researchers to create a better algorithm for recommendation. And they anonymize this data by replacing usernames uh, with a number. But again, this was not enough to anonymize this data because as in the case of Massachusetts, you can rely on another source of information and join the, the two data sets and then they anonymize uh, everything. So uh, another researcher, uh, Arvin Narayan, made to the, the anonymize this data set using the IMDB data. IMDB is a website where, where people uh, rate and uh, put uh, reviews of movies. And the rationale was that if Alice made these two reviews on IMDB, probably she made the same reviews on Netflix. I have the name, the names of people in IMDB because these are public, you get them using a web crawler, for example. You have the anonymized Netflix data, but you can try to merge the lines and match the lines and understand that this line is probably Alice and you can denonymize the row of Alice looking at the MDB data probabilistically, but they show that uh, this works very well. Uh, so the picture is not that easy because personal information about us are everywhere. Paul Ohm, a famous researcher, says that for almost every person on the air, there is some piece of information on some hard disk on some IT system here and there that can be used against us, for example, to discriminate us, harass us, or blackmail us. So we have to pay a lot of attention in this. There have been other attacks if you want to go more in depth. Uh, the researchers may manage to de-anonymize social network data or uh, the recommendation systems, for example, of online shops. If you go to go more in depth, I will provide you the slides. And finally, so what is privacy? And there is not a unique definition of privacy like for, uh, like for uh, big data. An old definition is that privacy is the right to be left alone. This definition is quite old. And then a more modern definition by Alan Weinstein is that it is the right to control, edit, manage, and delete information about themselves and decide when, how, and to what extent information is communicated to others. You can choose the definition that you want. And uh, now in the following, Luca Bassio will explain you some algorithm for uh, anonymization that potentially will work better than this. Okay, before uh, I leave the floor to, to Luca, I want to mention that if you want to get a certificate of attendance uh, to, this, uh, to this tutorial, you have to fill this module that I will write on the chat, fill it and we will provide you the certificate of attendance. The module actually is here. I will write it on the on the chat and also on the Slack channel. So please, for question and answers, use the Slack channel so because it's better, it's persistent. I will send you the link to the form also on both Slack channels and WebEx chat. So now I leave the floor to, to Luca. Thanks, Martina. Can you make me co-host? You are already co-host and you need to be presenter. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. 
Okay. So let's resume from, from what Professor Trevisan was saying. So now uh, let's go to the technical part. So which are some of the privacy preserving techniques that we can use? And we will, use, we will see two of them. One is canonymity and the other is differential privacy. The first one is very easy. Uh, that's why I'm presenting this, while the second one is much more formal and provides uh, better guarantees. And then finally, we'll, we'll show which tool to use, uh, and then you will work on yourself on, uh, on some example on data. So let's start with canonymity. Uh, in, in other, let's say, variation of it. Uh, and before that, let's a bit define better uh, the attributes that already Professor Travis had showed you before. So let's imagine we have a table. And in a table, we have many rows. Rows represents records. And we have many columns. Columns represent attributes. So some of these attributes are the so-called key attributes that are also called personal identifying information, uh, PII. And these are anything that can be used to identify the person directly just with that single attribute. Think about name. With name, I mean name plus your name. Think about the address. Think about the phone number or, or the email. If you have these, basically, you know uh, who is who who's this row belong to. And so these, by default, if you want to release uh, some statistics, some data set, you have to remove them, of course. Then there are the quasi-identifiers quasi attributes. These are a bit trickier because alone, if you take a single column, uh, this will not be sufficient to identify a single person. So uh, think about, uh, as the example before, if you have the birth date, well, that's not enough to, to know who you are. If you have the gender, if you have the zip code, these are not enough. However, these are still correlated with the person. And if you have enough of these quasi-identifier, then you can combine them and create from the quasi-identifier a unique identifier. And a unique identifier will be a key. And as, as we saw before, just for example, the zip code, the birth date, and the gender, if we have these three quasi-identifiers, we're able to identify 87% of the population in the US. And so if you have many data sets, you can combine them together and then you can de-anonymize data sets. And finally, we have the sensitive attributes. These are usually attributes that uh, are very, very uh, private for a user. For example, uh, medical records or salaries. However, these attributes are usually something really fundamental for, for, for the research for why the data set was collected. And so they are released. So think about if you want to do a research about uh, cancer uh, and if smokes maybe uh, is related to cancer, you need to, to, to say if someone got cancer or not, even if this was really a sensitive attribute. So to, to see an example uh, of a table, so the, the name is a key. And so if we want to release, then for sure we need to remove this column. Uh, date of birth, gender, and zip code are quasi-identifiers. So alone, they are, let's say, okay, no problem. However, they are correlated with the name. And so if we gave too much of this quasi-identifier, then uh, these will still leak privacy. And finally, there is the sensitive attribute that it leaks privacy, but just if it's connected to a, a real person. So. If we go back to the example that uh, Professor Trevisan shows, so this was the uh, release data set medical that was considered anonymous. And why they say that? Well, they remove social security number, they remove the name, and they say, okay, the rest is, is okay to publish. However, if you have other data set, and this is called a link attack, uh, and in this case it was the voter list, they were able to just by linking and finding the words, the, the sex of, of the person and, and the zip code to find out that this person, Sue Carson, had a shortness of breath. 
and also that she was a widow. And clearly, at the end, it's not anonymous. I mean, it's it's just anonymous towards, let's say, naive attacks. And so that's where uh, the anonymity kicks in. So the idea is to avoid what we saw in the slide. Uh, and so how can we do that? If we release a table, then the information of each person inside this table cannot be distinguished from at least other K-1 individuals, whose information is, is also in the release data set. So if you take the previous example, uh, and, and we have the information about the birthday, the zip, and the gender, uh, well, if we search in the data set for each combination of these three quasi identifier, there are always at least K people. And so we have to change this table in order to be K anonymous, of course, with K greater than one, because in this case, there was already, it was just one person that had these uh, characteristics. And so any combination of the quasi identifier should appear at least k times. So one is the one we want to hide and, and the other k minus one. Uh, this definition of canonymity was first appearing in 1998, so it's already 24 years. And, and, and there are a lot of different variations, but the, the key idea, the key concept is the one that I just showed you. And then how can we do that? we can do in different way. In general, the idea is that we have the quasi identifier and we have to change something in the quasi identifier. We can generalize, we've seen a couple of slides what it means. We can modify, we can distort or we can remove the quasi identifier values. So at the end, no individual can be identified uh, from a group of other uh, K, of other K minus one, so a group of K. So if you are uh, familiar with a SQL language, uh, what does it mean? How can we check if a table is canonymous? We just have to perform this query. So we have to check from the table and we have to group by the quasi-identifier combination. If you do that, it will be already doing for all the quasi-identifier combination. And then for each of these combinations, we'll find the count. So how many elements, how many records we have in the table. And if it's canonymous, then all these different rows, the results should be greater um, than k or equal to k. And so it's clear that k is somehow the degree of anonymity. anonymity. The greater is k, the more a person is, let's say, mixed within other, and so it would be really hard to, to, to understand who exactly is the person. Uh, let's see one way to achieve canonymity that is generalization. So each record uh, should be indistinguishable. And so these records that are indistinguishable are called equivalence class. And the idea is that uh, we have to create these equivalence classes by repla replacing the quasi identifiers that are too specific with less specific one that still keep uh, uh, semantics. So if you think about the zip code, well, maybe five digits is too much. Let's just keep the first three digits. That usually means it's still in the same area. Same for the age. So maybe 2092 is too much. Just, just keep that it's around 20. And of course, when you're grouping these, these are semantically correlated because they are closed. We cannot like put here uh, 97. It doesn't make sense to group these together. And, and well, sometimes five for the sex, if you want to group them together at the end, you cannot really publish anything, any information about the sex. So let's see an example of generalization. So uh, this table that actually was, uh, was taken from one of the original paper is K anonymous with K equal to one. So in this table, we have four quasi-identifier. And one sensitive attribute. And so if we check, for every combination of quasi-identifier, there are always 
at least two rows. In this case, two, 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 three in this case, two. And how, how the generalization was made? Well, the birth just kept the age and the zip was just limited to the four digit zip rows. And so if we take this recipe table and we add another data set that we want to link as previously in the previous example, well, we can take Andre that has this kind of information, but then at the end, we just know that this may be one of these three if it's inside data set. So we cannot really infer what is Andre's problem. Well, we can say maybe it's chest pain, maybe it's obesity, maybe it's short breath. Still, it's, it's, it's helping in the privacy. Uh, how can we reach in the optimal way the generalization? There are really a lot of canonization algorithms like greedy partitioning, bucketization, etc. We are not going into details, but all these problems try to find a multidimensional partition of the data uh, such that, of course, each partition needs to have at least uh, k points where k is the canonimity. So if you think about like, like here, you have a three-dimensional space with age at zip code, and we want to divide this, uh, this space in order that each partition still have k elements. So if k equal two, for example, this could be a solution. There are two elements in this partition, two elements in this partition, and two elements in this partition. Uh, see that here? It's multidimensional, so we're not just splitting the space, each dimension into two. We are doing multidimensionally. And we want to do it in an optimal way. What does it mean, optimal way? We want to still have the data set that is canonized, but we want to uh, minimize the information loss. That is, we want to maximize the utility of the data set. So if we don't divide anything, then we can just release data where instead of zip code, we have nothing, uh, age we have nothing, well, the, that is k anonymous, but it's not optimal. So we want to perform an optimal partition. And there are many algorithms. Why? Because the optimal k anonymous strict multidimensional partitioning is an NPR problem. So there are heuristics uh, uh, that, uh, let's say, do some approximation to solve this problem. But still, it's an NPR problem to find the optimal one. So we see generalization, actually, in some cases, we also have to use suppression. And in particular, in some cases, performing a generalization will cause too much information loss. So think about, we're interesting about outliers. So outliers, if you know, if you have a distribution, outliers will be really far, and it doesn't make really sense to group together with very far uh, data points. So usually what you do, you just remove the data outlier and then you divide into subgroups the other rest. Okay, so we talked so far about k anonymity, but what is k? One, two, three, four, and what it depends on. So again, think about a data set with rows, records, and attributes columns. So K will depend on the number of records. How? If we have more records, then it's easier to uh, reach privacy for the users. And so in this case, we can increase K and keep, let's say, still private. Still private and still um, uh, useful. So just, just let me go to the next slide because it's easier. So. You think about that you have an asset where you cannot have utility and privacy at the same time. So if you reach 100% privacy, so we, we're sure we're not disclosing anything, then we'll be really inaccurate. We're basically not releasing anything. So we'll have a utility of zero. If on the other side, we, uh, we don't care about privacy, then well, of course, we have the maximum utility, but it will be not private. Where we want to stay? Well, we want to stay here. So we have still high privacy, but also high utility, of course. OK, let me go back. Uh, so when the number of records increase, so k can increase without losing utility. 
Instead, when we have quasi identifier that increases, so we have more columns, uh, that's a problem because uh, there will be really a lot of different combinations of these quasi identifier. And so if we want to keep, still keep the same utility, we should actually decrease K. And this will be, of course, against privacy. And then also will depend on how the quasi identifiers are distributed and their relationship. So rule of thumb, really easy. If we increase K, then privacy increases, but also utility will decrease. So think about here, if we want utility equal to 100%, then K should be what? Should be equal to zero or equal to one, it's the same. So we just, we don't really require anything on the privacy. Instead, if we want everything to be private, well, we should not publish any quasi identifier. So K is unbounded, infinite, or, or, or the number of, of rows in the data sets. And so at the end, the problem is that it's a second. Okay. Uh, it's, it's hard to say the, the best value of K. It's always uh, a trade off, a compromise between utility and privacy. So if you take this, this example here, this is the same data set, just this is two anonymous, this is three, and this is four anonymous. So if it's four anonymous, if you see, all the rows, all the quasi identifiers are equal. So we're not really, uh, you cannot really use this data set for more statistics. If it's three, well, still we can discern something because there are two groups. And if it's two here, there are three groups. But of course, let's say here it's more utility, here it's more privacy. Okay, what is one of the problems of canonymity? The problem is that the generalization relies on special locality. So in order to generalize, each record must have k close neighbors. Because if, if it doesn't, and this is the problem that in the real world data set uh, are, are very sparse, and so you don't have k close neighbors, then what, what happens is that uh, you have to uh, generalize too much. So think about, I don't know, for example, the Netflix price. It has 70,000 dimensions because it has 70,000 uh, movies to see. And if I saw 100 movies, it's really hard to, to, to find a people in the asset that also saw more or less the same 100 movies. We should generalize, but it's really hard to generalize on so many dimensions because the space is so sparse that you have to put together people that, that really are not uh, doesn't have anything with each other. So just for example, if I want to know, sorry, what was here, but my space is parts, then my nearest neighbor is this one. Does it make sense to ask this query these nearest neighbors? Well, no, actually it's the same. If it's really sparse, distance loses information. Sorry, I'm putting it. And so the, the, the fact is that if we project the dimension, then we lose all info. And so canonymity is useless. If we don't, then we, we are not really uh, using canonymity. And, and so uh, people are basically give up their privacy. And that's a problem when you have too many quasi identifiers. You, you cannot really use uh, canonymity. Moreover, Canonymity uh, also is subject to different kind of attacks. So here I'm talking about canonymity as is like it's like shit. So I'm talking that it's subject to a lot of different problems, and it does. And this is really important that you know because it's canonymity is not safe. It's just providing some more privacy than this data set, but it's not safe canonymity. And I really want you to understand this. And in specifically, will not provide privacy. Uh, if in an equivalence class, the sensitive values doesn't lack diversity. And if the attacker has some background knowledge that you don't know. Let's see an example. So let's take this data set. This is three anonymous, so K equal to three. 
if you see there are different groups, all as at least three elements. These are the quasi identifier, and this is the sensitive attribute. So let's take, for example, Bob, and we know that Bob has the zip code this age. Well, we can say that it's one of these three, and then we check the sensible parameter is disease. Well, the three of them had heart disease. So what? Bob has heart disease. We, even though there were three people with the same quasi identifiers, there were just at the end one single disease. And the second attack is that we have background knowledge. So suppose we know car with the zip code and age. And let's suppose that from our data set and from other information, we can say that uh, car doesn't have our disease. So what happens? Sorry. What happens is that even though we have heart disease and cancer here in this uh, in this group, then by background knowledge we can remove heart disease, and so at the end we know that car has cancer. Again, not so private. What is a possible solution to these two attacks? It's called L diversity, that is combined together with can mint. And the idea is that in an equivalence class, we should have at least L well representative sensitive value. Well represented is not well defined because there are different ways to define this. So let's take an example. Again, zip code age as quasi identifier and disease as sensitive attribute. In this case, we'll have actually it's, it's k very large, it's k, k equal to six, and we have two groups. And we see the disease, it's, it's like diverse. There are uh, in the first one, one acne, uh, two ear disease and three flu. And also in the second one. So it's, it's quite diverse and that's why it's called L diversity. There are different definition of diversity. Uh, the, the easiest one is the distinct one. So the distinct just requires that in equivalence class, there will be L distinct sensitive values, L is equal to two, three, four, whatever you want. But there are also other that are a bit more sophisticated, the probabilistic and the entropy. All of them want in the end that there is uh, a diverse number and a diverse characteristics of the sensitive attribute. Okay, so we have L diversity. Is it enough? No, it's not. Actually, it's not enough, but it's also not necessary in some cases. Let's take these, these examples. So we have another set where the sensitive attribute is HIV positive or negative. And in this data set, uh, it's quite skewed. So we have 99% of HIV negative and just few of them that are positive. Then if we anonymize and we have different groups, let's see this group with the same quasi identifier. At the end, this has 50% of HIV positive. So one, two, three out of six. And so, yes, this group is diverse in the sensitive parameter. However, you can imagine that this leaks a ton of information because if you know people that has this combination of quasi identifier, you really can infer that is likely that he is positive to HIV. However, it's not even necessary because suppose that we have an asset that uh, actually, not as an uh, equivalence class that has all negative one. Here, there is one positive, but you can imagine even all, all, all negative. In this case, this won't be L diverse, even for, for L equal to two. However, given the fact that most of were already HIV negative, it will not really leak a lot of, because you know a priori that most of the people were HIV negative, you know now that most of the people with these quasi identifier are HIV negative. So also L diversity has some limitation we've seen, we've seen already. And the fact in this example that we just made is that the HIV positive and HIV negative had a really skewed difference in distribution, but also is a very different degrees of sensitivity. So knowing that a person had, was HIV negative is not that 
let's say, privacy invasive, why knowing that this person is actually positive will be really privacy invasive. And as you see, L diversity is unnecessary in, in this case, because in some cases, as the previous one, if you know that everybody are HIV negative, this will not really leak a lot. And also, L diversity is difficult to achieve, because in this case, where it's really skew, even if we have 10,000 records, that, well, for some medical analysis, already a lot, if we want to, to impose a two diversity, then we know already that we cannot really create a lot of equivalence classes. Why? Because we want to have an HIV positive in each class to be too diverse. This is this thing too diverse. And so at most, if we're really good into, into splitting the quasi identifiers, we will end up just with 100 equivalence classes. That maybe it's not enough for an analysis. And then we see the skewness attack that we just show you previously in the example that is the same thing as a probabilistic inference attack. So if you know a distribution a priori of HIV positive and negative, and then we end up with two classes, uh, one with most of them HIV positive and one of them with most HIV negative, uh, this one will be too diverse, but it will not leak anything. This one will be too diverse, but we leak a lot of, of information because almost all of these will be HIV uh, positive. And so your posterior probability will increase a lot. And, and finally, uh, we can also do another attack. So let's take this three diverse table. So this is three anonymous and three diverse because we have these three groups and each of these three groups, we have three different, three diverse uh, sensitive attributes. And let's suppose that Bob has this zip code and this age. And so we can basically say that this one of these. Well, we cannot say anything, but we can conclude something from the uh, semantic of the sensitive attribute. Also, so this one is sensitive. Why? Because we can say that well, both salary, we don't know what it is, but still we can say that it's relatively low with respect to the other. Moreover, gastric ulcer, gastritis, and stomach cancer are three diseases related with stomach. And so we can say that Bob has some stomach, stomach related disease. Because L diversity doesn't consider semantics. So let's see. We are see we're trying to 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 follow privacy, to, to find problems and then try to solve this problem over and over again. And this is okay, but we never have like a complete assurance that we cannot perform some kind of attacks. And that's why then later differential privacy will kick in. So just let's see briefly till the closeness. Uh, tree closeness uh, other than L diversity requires also the distribution of a sensitive attribute in any equivalence class will be close to the distribution of the sensitive attribute in the overall table. So you can perform the previous attack because at the end, more or less what you will know about the sensitive attribute will be more or less the same of the wall distribution. So your posterior probability will not increase. And in order to do so, you have to define a distance, T, that's why it's called T. And you can publish anything that in an equivalence class will have a distribution of sensitive attribute that is not too far within this threshold from the original one. And in order to do so, there's the earth move distance. I will, I will not really talk about this, but basically it's just a way to capture the semantic relationship and so a way to account how much a distribution changed to another, also considering the semantics. And let's see an example. So in this case, this is again, three anonymous. It's also three diverse. And in this case, we can measure, uh, actually we can define T at, for example, 0 0.2. And we can measure the T closeness of each group, of each equivalence class. And we can see that if we do that, the table will have a 
with respect to salary, we'll have a 0 0.17 closings. What does it mean? It means that if we take the wall salary distribution and we take just the small distribution of the subgroups of equivalence class, this will be close 1.17. And so this is below 0 0.2, and so we can keep it. Instead of the disease, if we do that, the disease at the end will have a 0 0.27 closings. And so this will be larger than 0 0.2, and so we can actually not publish this column. It will not be T close. And maybe you, you already have a question. So, but at the end, if, if, if all our statistics are equal, so why we want to publish the quasi identifier if they, if they don't have really a role? And that's, that's a very good question because if you want to do statistics, you want to infer something. We don't want every sub part of the database to be equal to the wall. And let's see another problem that we take this other set. This is k anonymous, k equal to two. This is L diverse, I think equal to two. And this is t close, I don't remember which kind of t. Still, I can say that this is not secure. Why? Because if an attacker, for example, know that the uh, Bob is Caucasian and he was admitted to the hospital with flu, so he had some side information about one sensitive attack, then he can say that, well, it's Caucasus, he lives here, Bob, so he is HB positive, even if it's uh, K anonymous, L diverse, and T close. And, and why? Because this is against the rule, because flu is, is a sensitive attribute. We are not protecting sensitive attributes. We're protecting according to the quasi identifier. However, that's another problem. So, K anonymity just works on quasi identifier, not on the sensitive attributes. And so, to conclude the K anonymity, uh, well, it, it's a good start if you want to uh, anonymize data set, but you have to know that this can be harmful. And with anonymity, you are basically taking a data set and you are making it canonymous. So it's not really the process that is anonymous, it's the data set that you publish that is canonymous. And, and still, you have to know that they can leak sensitive information. And, and also, there's this quasi identifier fallacy where you're not a priori that the attacker will not know certain information like the sensitive attribute. And the other problem is, as I, show, is, as I show you, is the crucial dimensionality that says that uh, if you don't have really as um, I said, it's not sparse, you cannot really do a generalization. And so, if you're applying the canonymity on this kind of sparse data set, you will destroy completely the utility of that. Okay, what is the solution then? Solution is differential privacy. Or actually, it's, it's, it's not a solution, it's a different approach that solves many of the problem of anonymity. Differential privacy is a rigorous framework for privacy preserving analysis of data sets. So, why is the whole concept of anonymization so hard? The fact is that for us, it's hard to guess the capabilities of the attackers, especially the one that we let in the future, because we don't know. What will be the future data set that somebody will publish? We don't know what will be the future techniques that the attackers will, will employ. And we don't even know which will be the computational power of the attackers 10 years from now, 20 years from now. It will be 10 times, 100 times, we don't know. And this is similar with cryptography. You know, crypto systems are designed uh, not to work just now, are based on what computers, quantum computers, will be able to do in 30 years. So to have really a lot of it's a, a margin towards attacks. And differential privacy is important because it provides mathematical privacy guarantee that are strong, quantifiable, and composable. I, I will explain what the term means. And it is by design, so you can actually mathematically prove that it is resilient to known and unknown attack modes. And differential privacy, uh, thanks to these characteristics, enable really to uh, 
uh, do a lot of different computation with personal data, keeping the data right. And we see in the, in the last slide that a differential privacy has this label of privacy, but actually it's not just related to privacy. It, it's a toolkit that can be used for a lot of different things. And just to put some history, it was first defined in 2006 by Chinsia Work, but it also has some roots in previous work from 1965 of randomized response. The idea is that why we want to uh, use data sets? Because we want to learn something from it. To learn what? To learn usually some statistics, especially if you're doing surveys. So suppose we have a research data set that shows the smoking causes cancer. So a certain smokers, uh, if this is true, then we see his insurance premium rise. Because then we know that, okay, you're smoking, then likely you will have cancer in the future. So smoker S will really not, is not interested in, uh, in, in participating to these and, and to show that smoking causes cancer. However, the, these things of the fact that uh, smoking causes cancer is true, even if as is not in the database, because it's clearly not just dependent on, on what S is doing, if, if this is true or not. And so actually in the end, uh, learning, it's just the whole point. We're not really interested to understand what S is doing. We're just, we want to learn that smoking causes cancer not what S is doing. And, and actually, if then if we learn this, then we also have a social impact because then the smoker can enroll in a smoking session program and it will stop. So the idea is that we don't want to put any arm in the participation in the data set. So smoker S will have some, let's say, harm, but it's not dependent on the participation. If it participates or not, then it will still have the, the same arm. So is is premium with rise. And so this is the idea of differential privacy. So posing no harm in participation, the outcome of any analysis uh, is essentially equally likely independent of whether an individual will take part or not in the survey in the database. And differential privacy is able to, to give mathematical uh, properties because it's assumed the worst case scenario. What is the worst case scenario? Is that an attacker knows everything. Just the, knows everything about all the people that say in the world. The only thing he doesn't know if in one user is or isn't in the data set. And how can the, the attacker interact with that set? He can perform queries. And and then the answer of these queries will not int, should not int the presence of the user. And this is what's the concept of blood and privacy that says that if we are giving overly accurate answers on too many questions, then of course we will not have privacy. And here the two key points are too many questions. So we cannot ask too much. But even more important is that the answers of the question shouldn't be too much accurate. Let's see an example. So we know everything and we want to know if a certain data set, if a certain um, a person, let's say Luca, myself, is in a data set. And so we have this data set with different person, with different eight, and we know that I mean, the query is the average eight, and this is 171. We have another database that is equal, except that here Luca is in the dataset. And if we perform the same query, so we want to know the average, then this will increase to 176 because I'm 190. And so an attacker, let's suppose, what I have to do to just know if Luca is or isn't in database, given that the attacker knows everything? Well, just ask to the dataset, the average eight. And if this returns 176, then of course the attacker knows that Luca is in the dataset. If instead, if we return 171, Luca is not. 
But now let's suppose that instead the system is a bit different, the mechanism. Let's suppose that instead of returning the average eight, it returned the average eight plus some nodes. For example, 173. In this case, what can the uh, attacker assume? Nothing, because it's for sure not 176 and 171. So we don't know if it's look at it's inside the data set or not. And even if the noise is something different, I don't know, 179, we still cannot say for sure that Luca is in. We can just say maybe, well, more likely, a bit more likely, Luca is inside. So before providing you the formal definition of differential privacy, uh, let's just see some, some basic setup. So we have a database D, which potentially contains sensitive information. And we have a curator of the database that he has access to the full database. For now, we assume this is trusted. And then we are, or the attacker, uh, wants to analyze the data. And what we can do, we can ask a series of queries. And of course, then we let the answer. And the way the answer are provided by the curator are called mechanism. And if we take one database and another one, the prime, that are equal except for a single entry, then these are called neighboring data set. To put in a picture, imagine this is a data set, x1, xn. We, we, we want here a mechanism that provides an output, and we have a second one that this is d, this is d prime, that it's equal except for x2 prime, that is different. And then what we want, we want that this output that arrives here is not too far. Let's say the distribution of, of these uh, output will keep a distance less than epsilon. And this is the idea of differential privacy. Let's see a bit just the formula. So we have a query mechanism. So M is operating, uh, answering your query. And we say that this is epsilon differential privacy. If we take two databases that are neighboring, so D and D prime, as in the previous slides, and we know that the output of the query mechanism is uh, uh, could be C, so C is just one of the possible one or, or a range of the possible output of the mechanism. If the probability of the output in D it's very similar to the probability of the output given the prime, given the neighboring data set. And how these are related? Well, with a constant, e to the power of epsilon. And epsilon is this epsilon differential prime. So given the fact that d and d prime uh, can be interchangeable, then of course we can also create the, the opposite uh, uh, inequality, so we can say that also we have one over e to the power of epsilon probability of m d prime in C. And so we can see that it's really bounded between e to the power of epsilon and e to the power of minus epsilon. So this definition says that if we have two output, these two output should have really a bound in what's the ratio. We can also divide the two, and then we know that the ratio is e to the power of epsilon. And so the output will not depend too much on a single tuple because at maximum there will be this ratio e to the power of epsilon. And the participation in that set will pose no additional risk because we know that it will not depend on it. So let's see what this epsilon exactly is. So this is a parameter, it's arbitrary, so it chooses an a priori, and it controls the privacy of the system. So if we have a low epsilon, then the two quantities, of course, will be similar. Why? Because e to the power of epsilon, if, for example, epsilon approaching zero, e to the power of epsilon approaches one. So basically, um, we are saying that the two probabilities should be the same. And so we don't, we have low privacy. If instead, I, we have an i epsilon, it means that uh, this is, is increasing e to the power of epsilon, so the ratio uh, can, can diverge, so the two quantities can be more far apart. 
so we're talking about query mechanism, but uh, we can do a different kind of queries and not queries are, not all the queries are the same. Some are more intrusive, some are less. And there is a second, let's say, uh, it's not a parameter, it's a characteristic of the query that characterizes the query and it's called sensitivity. Uh, so we can associate value of this metric sensitivity with each query f. And usually this sensitivity will depend on how much the output will be between f of the data set and f of the data set uh, neighboring, so a little bit different. And one of the possible definition of sensitivity is global sensitivity, that is the DL1 difference. So basically the maximum of the difference. It's called GS of F. So there are also local sensitivity, uh, you know, but we'll not talk here in this tutorial. And so the idea is that if uh, a function, if a query, it's really depending a lot on small variation of the data set, then it means that it's a sensitive query. And so we should add more nodes. If instead is insensitive, then we can increase, we can provide less things. What is the implication of this global sensitivity? So let's take an example. Let's take a, a query f that is the average for sets of number between uh, zero and one. So we have basically uh, something that goes from zero one to zero one, for example, the average. And so uh, what will be the maximum output uh, of what will be the global sensitivity? Well, uh, just think about the worst case scenario. So if we have all zeros in D and we have all zeros, but a one in D prime, this is the worst case because the average here, the average is zero and in this case is one over n, where n is five in this case. And so the maximum possible is one over n. And so we can see that the global sensitivity of the average is one over n. This is just a sketch of the proof, of course. Uh, let me just delete this. And there are some queries like counting that can be answered accurately. Because, for example, if you want to do a count, then of course the one tuple can affect maximum by one. So the global sensitivity is one. Because if you're counting how many people's mocks, if you are in or you are out, it is plus minus one. So global sensitivity is one. And so you can just add a small amount of noise for this kind of queries. Instead, others are hard to answer. For example, if you want the maximum function, this will be greatly, greatly affected by a single tuple. Actually, it would be unbounded because if you have a set, you can have a, a new tuple that is going to infinity, and so the max is, is can change uh, unbounded. And obviously, differential privacy will never be able to really provide usefulness to a query where you actually want to know the maximum. Because by definition, maximum is not a statistics. It's, it's really dependent on what a single person will do. And so there's always a challenge because there's a trade-off uh, between uh, noisy and utility. So just see one of the possible mechanisms. Because we say, OK, we have to add noise, but which kind of noise we, have, we can add? So the idea is. We, we ask a query, f of d, and we return not really the same, but f of d plus noise. So the intuition is f d can be released when f is insensitive to the individual entries. And so we want the f d plus noise to be epsilon indistinguishable. How this noise should be generated depending on epsilon and global sensitivity? There's a very famous theorem that says that if we take as a mechanism the, uh, the query, the, the real query, the real output of the query, plus we add 
a Laplacian noise with parameter global sensitivity divided by epsilon, then this mechanism is epsilon distinguishable. So you may ask why Laplacian and not others? We call the Laplacian things are easier because Laplacian, what they are basically are just two symmetric exponential. And so if you're doing the logarithm of this one, then for two function, the difference of the ratio, sorry, the ratio of the difference will be always equal to epsilon. And of course, it's a to the power of epsilon. And so you can easily prove that by using Laplacian noise uh, with simple this parameter, then the uh, mechanism will be epsilon distinguishable. Uh, so given this, we, we, we now we were fine. So we have a mechanism that we can really quantify how much noise to add when the function is more sensitive. Why? Because the set of Laplacian is something like this, or can be something like this. So this is when, this is with more noise. So with GS, sorry, GS over epsilon is, let's say, going towards infinity. And this is where GS divided by epsilon is going towards zeros. So if we have a more sensitive uh, query, then we have to add more noise. And instead, if we want more privacy, remember epsilon is a denominator, then we need to have lower epsilon, and so we need to increase the noise to add. And so this is one of the possible mechanisms. There are actually many different, also with Gaussian noise or others. We just keep to this because it's very easy. And we can, one can say, well, okay, we, we can answer by providing some noise, but what if we allow people to perform the same query over and over again? Well, eventually, given that we know also the shape of the noise, uh, we will be able to cancel out the noise. And so we will be able to obtain the true value. And this is when the properties of differential privacy came up. So, so the first one is group privacy. So if we have a epsilon privacy mechanism, this will provide privacy for a difference in one user. Or well, let's suppose we are five users, we are a family, for example. Then if the mechanism is epsilon private, then we can say that for five people, the mechanism will be five epsilon private. And so you can really just sign it. And this is, let's say, a sub part of the larger composability study about differential privacy. And the idea is that it's true, it was in the previous slide, that if you apply sanitization multiple times, if you apply DP multiple times, we will have a degradation, but this is graceful. What we mean by graceful? So if a mechanism satisfies epsilon one differential privacy, and we have another mechanism that satisfies epsilon two differential privacy, then if we output both the mechanism, then we can just sum up the two epsilon. So epsilon one plus epsilon two differential privacy. And actually, if you're a bit smart and we don't do requests independently, we can even uh, improve this linear uh, sum of the epsilon. And actually, we can actually just reach the, it to be proportional to the square root of the number of applications. So if we do n, let's say smart queries, it will not be an epsilon, it will be square root of an epsilon. And finally, it's robust and we can prove that it's robust to side information. So we don't need to specify what the adversary knows and we don't care if, if, if the adversary will know a lot of things in 20 years from now, we don't care. And even more important, any post-processing cannot improve the attacker's knowledge. So even if there is a mechanism 10 years from now that it's you know, very elaborate and we apply these to our epsilon um, private data set given from an epsilon uh, private uh, mechanism, still we cannot improve the factor knowledge. And so if we need to query multiple times, uh, 
the data set, uh, what can we do? One possible solution is privacy badge. So epsilon is not just specific of the single uh, query. We have an epsilon, let's say, uh, that can sum up to up to a privacy budget. And after this one, you cannot ask uh, any more queries. And given the privacy consumption is additive, if I have you know, an object of, uh, a budget of 10, then I can choose as an analyst, if I, can, if I want to do 10 queries with epsilon equal to one, so a lot of privacy, or just one queries, with epsilon equal to 10. So very precise query, I can answer just one. So it's really, really flexible. And just to give you an hint, uh, if you want to increase the number of queries, we can use coordinate nodes. So to save on the map, just to show what we do in the lab, the Instagram queries. So let's suppose we do want to do a count. For example, how many people are between 45 and 50? And we have a certain epsilon. So you will take this five and you will add some noise to this five. And then let's suppose we want to know the people between 25 and 30. So we take these and we're using another epsilon. So if we, if we need to do these D times, because we have D beans, this will account in the end for a noise of Laplace of the over epsilon. Why D? Because we have DB, so we have to increase the sensitivity or increase the budget. But actually, if you think about uh, not only, I mean, one, the whole D beans are not independent. Because if you change one from here, maybe it, it will go here. So you don't really need to lose all this information. You can you actually only need to add the noise once because, as we know, the sensitivity generalized as the maximum distance. So instead of performing this query independently and adding noise to each of them, we can just add this noise once and for all, and we still provide privacy guarantee. So Differential privacy, it's a huge uh, research field nowadays. And so we have a lot of different options, just, just to, for you to know. What if we don't trust the data curator? There is something called local differential privacy, where you are basically adding noise before entering the database. What if we want to publish data set once, so we don't really want to do the queries in an interactive way? There is so-called non-interactive differential privacy where you actually are releasing everything. And finally, actually not finally, but what if we have categorical values and not, uh, let's say, you know, counters, for example? There are other mechanisms also for this, and the one for categorical is called the exponential uh, mechanism. And another thing that is also uh, really used re uh, recently uh, is, is, is the hypothesis that the attacker knows everything. It's really strong. It needed to be future proof, but actually we can use a relaxed uh, version of differential privacy. And in this way, we assume that we know everything about the element changing, but just statistical knowledge of D and D prime, not exactly all D and all D prime. So, to, to conclude differential privacy, we have a lot of pros, so it's rigorous, it's flexible, it's robust to cross-processing, and we can choose the level of privacy axiom. However, there are some cons, because the precision of the queries is affected. If you want to do a query that is not a statistical analysis, but it's, for example, to know an outlier, then we lose a lot of precision. And then it's hard to explain, and this could be a problem in companies, However, I mean, the same thing is for cryptography. Cryptography is, is, is nowadays the standard used everywhere. And, and then uh, we, we know that since we're adding noise, in order for a uh, differential privacy algorithm to be useful, we really need large upsets. And finally, one question could be what epsilon and what privacy budget is reasonable? So it's true that we can choose, but what is reasonable? And for that, it's, it's quite complex because you can go through a process 
as the US census did for last year's census. And at the end, you have to find a trade off and find a value that you think it's good. So, to, to conclude, uh, uh, well, okay, you talk a lot about differential privacy and canonymity, but uh, why do I need differential privacy if I don't really care about privacy? I, I, I'm using outside that it's not private. So, should I just don't use differential privacy? Uh, differential privacy is a toolkit. So, you you know that almost any usage of the data that is not careful crafted will leak something. And DP is carefully crafted. And so you know that with differential privacy, uh, will not leak anything. But we also know that statistics, in order to generalize well, should not be dependent on single instances. So it's the same thing as for machine learning. So we don't want machine learning to our fit and training. We don't want to leak things that are just specific on the training. And so if you want statistics to generalize, it's really important that you have to carefully craft it, an operation. And so actually you can use differential privacy, not for privacy, but to ensure the statistical validity of exploratory data. So if something with or with, without differential privacy will end up with different results, then likely your original data is not statistically valid for your query. And so to conclude, uh, at the end, better privacy also needs better data. Like it's really important in a big data framework. So these are some of the researchers I took inspiration from, from this presentation. And I think we can make a five, 10 minutes pause, and then we can move to the practical part uh, back with Professor Trevisan. Thank you, Luca. I'm back. Okay, let's see if there are some questions. Otherwise, we can, uh, I would say, we can proceed with the hands on part. Uh, I think we can make a five minutes break. So, yes, what time is it? Yes, we can restart at uh, 4 40. So yes, everybody can have a, a small pause. Remember that you that uh, if you want the certificate of attendance, you have to fill the form. I will send you again the link on this chat, and also it is on the Slack chat. Okay. And we will uh, send you by email the certificate once we make it. I think also we will share the slides later on the website so if you want to take a look later or go on see again some details we will share with it yes also this is recorded so if you miss some part or you want to be refreshed on some concept you can rewatch it on youtube in uh, a few days we will put it on youtube 